This is Radio EcoShock with former nuclear industry executive and expert witness Arnold Gunderson from Fairwinds.com. Arnie, before we get back to this ultimate threat, it seems to me, of nuclear fuel rods dangling in a very damaged building and two damaged buildings at Fukushima, Japan, I have to say the triple meltdown of the reactors operating at the time of the quake, that's not over either. What is the news about reactor number two, for example? Well, number two has... They were able to get a probe into the containment, not into the reactor, but into the containment. They had thought there would be 30 feet of water. In fact, there was only two feet of water. And you're counting on the water as shielding. And the radiation exposures were um, 7,000 R an hour, which basically would kill you in 10 minutes. So it's a radiation exposure that that would kill carbon-based life forms. And it's also so high that it will wipe out robots pretty quickly, too. And that's the bad news is that that the numbers are so high, but that's the best unit. Unit 2 is the one that people can get closest to. Unit 1 and Unit 3 are even worse. So the the question is, how are they ever going to get these cores cleaned up? Because it's coming from the radioactive cores. You know, we're at a point where we have to count on brand-new science. There's nothing on the market and nothing foreseeable that's going to um, be able to go into these containments and knock those exposures down. The alternative is to wait 300 years because most of it is coming from cesium, and um, 300 years out, those numbers will drop down. But if the alternative is waiting 300 years, somehow I don't think that's very politically palatable. Wow. So we need to invent a technology that hasn't been invented yet. So, Arnie, I think it's time to think the unthinkable. Walk us through what could happen if we wake up one day and the news is just this, that Fukushima Daiichi Reactor 4, the fuel pool, and and the building have collapsed. Uh, um, There's a Brookhaven National Lab study that actually talks about this. The building doesn't have to collapse, or, or the bottom of the fuel pool just has to break. Now, Fortunately, back right after the accident, one of the very first things the uh, Tokyo did, Tokyo Electric did, was put an enormous number of brand new structural supports under the bottom of the pool. But the building is unstable because it's been damaged by its own explosion, and separately, though, it's been damaged by the explosion right next door to Unit 3. So in a severe earthquake, 7 or better, it's likely to break. And whether break means you know, collapse and lay on its side like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, or the, um, the pool itself just shatters, I don't know. But uh, in, in either case, the, the outcome is this. The uh, water drains and the uh, fuel gets hot, physically hot. Two things happen. The water was providing shielding as well as cooling, and the um, exposures on site become astronomical. We looked at this back in the States when uh, Dresden, Dresden 1, almost had a fuel pool drain all its water. Uh, it, they forgot to turn the heat on when the unit was shut down and the pipes froze, and uh, it almost caused the entire fuel pool to drain because of these frozen pipes. They estimated that if the Dresden pool had drained, no one could have gotten within uh, three or 400 feet of the thing. And, of course, this pool is much bigger with much more radiation. So... The first issue is that you'd have to evacuate a significant part of the site just because the gamma rays coming out of the pool were so great that you couldn't get near it. The second thing happens in perhaps a day or two where the fuel gets hot enough to ignite in air. Zirconium, which is what the fuel is clad with at 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, wants to absorb oxygen. And if the oxygen is in water, it will suck up the oxygen in water and create hydrogen, which happened in the, in the explosions on 1, 2, and 3. But if the fuel is just exposed to air, it's going to take the oxygen out of air and burn. You know, when it's going to create zirconium oxide, and that's basically a fire. So if the fuel catches fire, uh, you volatilize the cesium, you volatilize the strontium, you volatilize the plutonium, and, uh, you know, a witch's brew of other, uh, of other isotopes, which then go airborne as a um, micron-sized hot particle, and they get breathed in. My advice to our friends in Tokyo is every morning check the tube and make sure that Unit 4 is still standing. And the moment you hear Unit 4 is not still standing, leave. And that's been my advice for, for a year. So 
And the, the health consequences, the Brookhaven study says tens of thousands uh, of fatalities from cancers because of the hot particles that are thrown up from the fire. Now, from the selfish point of view of someone living on the west coast of North America, and, and I guess for everyone in the northern hemisphere, it seems to me the key point is whether there is a major explosion that could drive these radioactive materials into the stratosphere where they will spin around the world. And how do you estimate the risk of a major explosion if that Reactor 4 building collapses, for example? Yeah, I don't think it's going to be an explosion. I think it's going to be a fire. But I still would be concerned if I lived on the West Coast. The heat of this fire is extraordinary. So that the particles have a, are buoyant. You know, they're, they're going to be extraordinarily hot, you know, 3,000 degrees. Um, so you're going to have an upward-moving thermal plume that's going to push this thing up five, six, seven miles, um, and then it'll be pushed by the jet stream. The, the hot particles we've already seen on the West Coast probably didn't come from a single event, but were lifted by these the smoky fires that we experienced back in March of last year. This fire would be hotter, so it would uh, you know essentially be this pyre of ionized gases that would, would lift the hot particles up high enough uh, to get in the jet stream and hit the West Coast. So... You know, there's a lot of air between the west coast, the west coast of the United States, and the east coast of Japan. So certainly, the Japanese would have to worry more. But you know, it would be appropriate to have you know, monitoring planes looking for the plume and letting people know where the plume was if this event happens. You know, I think we all just have to pray that one, th- this earthquake doesn't happen until the fuel is out. I think it's pretty clear it will happen, but it doesn't happen until the fuel is out. Or if it does, it's a small enough earthquake that the building doesn't doesn't crack. Yeah, I think we have to make this clear to listeners that this isn't a guaranteed event, that we don't have to totally panic right now, because there is a possibility that we may luck our way through this and not have yet another major, major nuclear event from Fukushima. But there is the possibility it could happen. And so from my point of view, Arnie, we, we've just got to get the Japanese or or some international body to do as much as we can to make it as safe as we can. Yes, you're absolutely right, as quick as we can. We're in a world where people don't like to be, which is these low-probability, high-consequence events. Because of the damage to this unit and because of the um, increased seismicity in Japan over the last three or four years, it's no longer low-probability, like one in a million. Now, if it's one in a hundred, that's awful. Uh, because the consequences are so severe that even a one in a hundred event would be, uh, you know, mathematically devastating. Yeah, we just we couldn't recover from it in anything in a meaningful human time scale. As you know, Dr. Robert Alvarez, an expert with the Union of Concerned Scientists, has tried again and again to warn us about this that it isn't just a problem in Japan. And you've said this too. The American reactors have built up even more stored fuel rods some of them over earthquake fault lines, like in California, all of them requiring nonstop cooling. None of the storage pools that I know of have containment if there is an accident. Can you talk to us about the risk of, in, in America? Well, the Mark I pools, and there's 23 in America, don't have a containment above them, and also the Mark IIs, and there's four or five of those. I can't remember. The General Electric Mark Threes, and there's only a few of those, but... Also, the pressurized water reactor pools are much better protected. So the the real problem is these 23 Mark Ones in the United States, and you know there's two in um, on Taiwan, and there's um, so in America we have left all of our fuel in these spent fuel pools. I was speaking uh, at the Boston Library um, last summer with Dr. Gordon Thompson. And um, he calculated that there's more cesium in the Pilgrim Pool, and this pool is, you know, 40 miles from downtown um, Boston, than in the 800 bombs that were blown up in the atmospheric testing during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so if that pool were to catch fire, and, you know, the, the consequences go beyond what, what the Brookhaven lab numbers were. The, the key question is, why are we leaving it there? And the, and the answer, unfortunately, is money. The owners of the plants, the technology is there. You, you um, reconstitute the fuel, put it in a cask, and put it down on the ground, and it's called, and, and it doesn't have to be water cooled, it can be air cooled. Each of those casks costs a couple million bucks, and you need 
perhaps 30 of them. So we're looking at $100 million exposure, financial exposure, to the utility that owns the plant. But the consequence is the public exposure is dramatically less. The, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has consistently bowed to the uh, utility desires to keep the fuel there to save $100 million a reactor. And it's a risk that we shouldn't be taking even before Fukushima. Now, Dr. Alvarez has been saying this now since, I don't know, 1994. So he's been a voice in the, in the wilderness on this for you know, close to two decades. And it all boils down to money. There's absolutely not a single technical reason why we can't get the fuel out of those pools and into dry storage on the ground. Is there anything that you'd like to add for our listeners as we wrap up? You know, I, I guess two things. One is that this debt of gratitude that I constantly feel toward the uh, perhaps 2,000 uh, men and, and, and a few women that basically saved the world back in March of last year. I'm not talking about the TEPCO executives because they totally botched this, but the men and women at those sites during the first week or two risked their lives and, and certainly have increased their probability of cancer selflessly, and I think we all owe them a, a debt of gratitude. The, the second thing is that we're dealing with a technology that can destroy a country. Um, Nikolai Gorbachev said in his uh, memoirs that uh, Chernobyl destroyed the Soviet Union, not perestroika. And, of course, we're watching Japan teeter right now. Should that fuel pool catch fire, it will cut Japan in half, you know, from east to west. And uh, you can't have a functioning state when you've got a, a ribbon of radioactivity that's you know, 50 miles wide running across the entire country. We really need to think about, is this a technology that, um, that we should be um, doubling down on, or is this a technology we should be developing a strategy to walk away from over time so that we can um, you know, move on to something that's a lot less risky? We have been talking with one of the few nuclear industry experts who will talk. Arnie Gunderson and his wife Maggie are the team at Fairwinds.com. In addition to informing the public, they offer expert testimony in nuclear court cases and government hearings. Be sure and support them at their website, Fair, the letter E, Wins.com. Arnie, thank you again for this update. Thank you for having me, and, and thank you for caring enough to do the update. I'm Alex Smith for Radio Ecoshock. Shock.